sterling effort from England in the Euros. So what will happen when Saturday comes? <laughs> England's euphoria finally beating Germany. What now? For once, we've got a team that can probably go a lot further. We can go that next step. We can get to the final this tournament. Next stop, Rome, though. But while England are flying out to Italy, the fans aren't. Also ahead. Hancock's half hour at PMQs as the Prime Minister is pushed over whether he sacked his former health secretary. The COVID isolation crisis in schools, the education secretary is asked if daily testing is the solution, why isn't it being brought in now? Another holiday cancelled, this time it's the stamp duty one, how some buyers will soon be paying thousands more. And here we go again, Andy Murray's facing a German player who wants to stop his Wimbledon comeback. This is the ITV Lunchtime News with Nina Hussain. Good afternoon. It was a where were you when moment that England fans were hoping for and boy did England deliver. Gareth Southgate's defensive strategy came good in the first half. Then we saw the sparkle late in the second with two goals in just over 10 minutes. The glory was shared between the stars at the back from the goalkeeper Jordan Pickford and defender Harry Maguire to the game changer Jack Grealish. Harry Kane finally did what Harry Kane does best and Raheem Sterling continued his scoring streak. Next stop, the quarterfinals on Saturday in Rome. Here's Chloe Keady. The word celebration doesn't quite cover it. This was a heady mix of rapture, redemption and relief. Not just because England are through to the quarterfinals of Euro 2020, but because they beat Germany, at whose hands they have endured decades of knockout defeats. Amazing, electric, bro. It was crazy. With the look of the draw, we can go all the way now. Yeah, with ease, with ease, yeah, all the way. Watch. After a nervous start, Sterling, England's top scorer, showed his talent, a magical display of things still to come. Germany restarted the second half with equal measure, but Pickford excelled for England once again. Then the moment fans and the country had waited years for. Quick footwork and Sterling was there to claim well-deserved glory. And cue for the stadium and the country to celebrate a momentous victory. I hope we can go all the way. When you look at the teams that have gone out, France are out, Holland are out, Germany are out, Portugal are out. Um, you're now looking at it where you have to say that we have a chance. We're not conceding, we're gaining more and more confidence. Peter Shilton was in goal the day England lost to Germany in the Italia 90 World Cup semi-final. We put that to rest now, I think, with looking forward as a country and as, and a, as a team. I'm sure Gareth, you know, will, will be uh, experienced enough to know that, um, you know, he's got to get the players' feet on the floor for the next game, you know, because, you know, they'll be so elated. You know, we don't want to be complacent. The team was back in training this morning. To progress to the semi-finals, they'll have to beat Ukraine in Rome on Saturday. Anyone travelling there from England faces a five-day quarantine, and so fans are being asked not to go. But little is likely to dampen the spirits of England supporters today, who for the... Joining me now is the former England manager, Sven Joran Eriksson. Thanks for talking to us on this uh, day of days. Look, remember when Greg Dyke took over the FA in 2013? He promised us and he, he warned us to be patient that these England stars, the young stars, would come come good in 2020. That happened last night. They beat Germany. What did you make of their performance? I think it was an extremely good uh, performance defensively. The whole game, they defended very, very well. And second half, uh, and especially extra time, they were sparkling, even attacking. And I mean, Sterling scoring goal again. Harry Kane, 
uh, this time they will reach the final. I can't see them lose against uh, Ukraine or Denmark or Czech Republic. No, they will. Well, we'll they we'll will have reach to wait the final. And see. We'll have to wait and see. When we look <laughs> in, in terms of uh, in terms of uh, man of the match, you know, we've just seen Sterling's brilliant goal, another brilliant goal from Sterling, uh, Pickford. In goal, doing a brilliant defensive job. Jack Grealish coming on, Harry Kane scoring, and Southgate himself. You know his tactics seem to pay off. Who was, who was your man of the match? Well, I would say Sterling. He created a lot of problems for uh, for the opponents, and um, he scored a goal again. He's extremely in a good shape in this moment. So, Sterling, man of the match. Look, it wasn't uh, Sweden's night as soon as the uh, final whistle went on the England match. It, it was uh, Sweden versus Ukraine, of course, your team. Um, we can't really just write off uh, Ukraine, though, can we? We can't, we can't see them as a, as a free pass into the semis, or, albeit a, a team that we would hope on paper we could beat. No, of course you cannot, because it's a quarterfinal in the uh, Europeans. So, of course, it's not easy. But uh, I tell you, I can't see England lose that game. They, they, they will knock Ukraine out of the tournament. I'm quite sure about that. England are going to Rome. We know that their fans can't go to Rome be because of the pandemic. They're not the only team that's had to do without um, their fan support in, in uh, stadiums in, in this tournament, in this time of a pandemic. Will that impact them, though? Because they've had this brilliant support at Wembley. Uh, you could hear it last night, even though there was only 40,000 fans. Will they be able to do what Wales did and, and in that, that first match in Baku, just not, not, not kind of worry about the fact that their, their team aren't there supporting them, their fans aren't there supporting them? Well, the atmosphere at Wembley yesterday was fantastic, even from uh, television. Uh, incredible. And it was very, very nice. It will not be the same, probably, in Olympic Stadium in Rome. But England today, they are so strong. So I don't think they, they will... That will not create a problem for them. Absolutely not. Just a quick question to you. Are you jealous of Gareth Southgate and the team that he's got in the matches that are <laughs> coming up? Would, it rather, would you rather it was you? No, I'm not jealous. Of course I'm not. Uh, my time uh, was many, many years ago and we did okay, we did well. But um, uh, Southgate is doing a great job and I'm very happy to see England uh, doing what they're doing in this moment. And once again, you will reach the final. I'm quite sure about that. Let's wait and see, Sven Jorex. And thank you for your optimism and enthusiasm. Uh, lovely to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you. To the rest of the day's news now. And the Labour leader wanted one question answered today. Did the Prime Minister sack Matt Hancock or not? Boris Johnson didn't answer repeatedly. Instead, he repeatedly told Sir Keir Starmer and the Commons there was a change of health secretary the day after the story of Matt Hancock's affair broke. Here's our political reporter, Shehab Khan. Prime Minister, why didn't you sack Matt Hancock? That question is plaguing Boris Johnson, who would have hoped that the resignation of his former health secretary would have been the end of the story. Matt Hancock resigned on the weekend after it emerged he had an affair with an aide. But today, at Prime Minister's questions, the Labour leader probed for more details. Why didn't the Prime Minister sack the former health secretary on Friday morning? I read the story in common with uh, you and uh, everybody else on, on Friday, and we had a new health secretary in place by Saturday. I think uh, to move from one health secretary to the next uh, with that uh, speed uh, was, was fast. Mr Speaker, what a ridiculous answer. On Friday, the Prime Minister's spokesperson said, quote, the Prime Minister considers the matter closed. Can the Prime Minister clarify, now he's got the chance, did he sack the health secretary or at any point ask him to resign? Yes or no? The, the Honourable Gentleman will notice that the, 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 the health secretary has changed uh, in the last five days. He, he complains about... He complains about the speed uh, with which that happened. This government moved a positively lightning speed. Having heard the answers, the Labour leader then pressed on why he thinks this issue matters. He spoke of 27-year-old Oli Bibi, who died in hospital with leukaemia during the pandemic. 
His family weren't able to spend time with him properly. His mum said, I'm livid. We did everything we were told to do. And the man who made the rules didn't. How can that be right? So I asked the Prime Minister again, how could you possibly think this matter was closed? What we are doing as a government, instead of focusing on stuff going on within the Westminster bubble, we are focusing on rolling out that vaccine, uh, those vaccines at a, a rate that will make sure that people like Ollie and his family do not have to suffer in the future. Mr Speaker, I can hardly think that the Prime Minister thinks it's appropriate in response to a question about Ollie to suggest that this is, in his words, the Westminster bubble. It's the wrong response to Ollie's case. I can't help concluding that the Prime Minister didn't ask relevant questions on Friday morning had he asked the Health Secretary if he'd broken any other rules. Uh, Mr Speaker, let me be absolutely clear with the right honourable gentleman. Uh, and I think the whole House and the whole country can see that we have a new Health Secretary in place and have had one since the day after the stories appeared. And that was entirely right. The resignation of the Health Secretary was the focus today. But the Prime Minister will be keen to see the back of this story and put the spotlight on his July 19th deadline instead. She had the Prime Minister pressed and pressed again about Mr Hancock's departure, but no direct answer to the Labour leader's questions. Yeah, this is the first time we've seen the Prime Minister come under sort of repeated questions about what happened. Um, and you're right to say that the Labour leader, Keir Starmer, asked a question over and over again, wanted to know whether or not the Prime Minister had told Matt Hancock to resign, essentially whether he sacked him. And we got the same answer over and over again. The Prime Minister said that the news story broke about the affair on Friday and there was a new health secretary on Saturday. Now, that is factually correct. That is the timeline of what happened, but the question was focusing on whether or not the Prime Minister told him to go. Now, one thing we do know is that the Prime Minister's official spokesperson did say on Friday that the Prime Minister viewed this matter as being closed, and that's where this discrepancy lies. Now, the Prime Minister will want to see the back of this. He will want to focus on the July 19th deadline, and the Labour leader will keep pressing on this because I think he thinks there's cut through and that people at home care. Giab Khan, thank you very much. Well, the Education Secretary was questioned too today over the new COVID crisis in schools. Record numbers of pupils off in England for COVID-related reasons. Labour asked if, uh, if he has a solution, Gavin Williamson, for scrapping isolation with daily testing. Why isn't he bringing in that, that in now rather than in September? Gavin Williamson was also pushed on why masks are being worn in shops but not schools and when any changes would be announced. We constantly assess all available data and we expect to be able to confirm plans to lift restrictions and bubbles as part of step four. Once that decision has been made, we'll issue guidance immediately to schools. So that could be July the 19th. The uh, Education Secretary really under pressure today, Joshua Stokes. Yes, well, there's been growing backlash in Parliament and across the country uh, due to the number of children being forced into self-isolation. That's because when a classmate tests positive for COVID, it can often lead to large numbers of school children quarantining at home. That's because they're all bubbled up in one group, uh, which can sometimes see whole year groups forced into isolation. And this is also forcing parents into that isolation as well. So the government, today government ministers are looking at bringing in daily testing for schools instead, but this won't take effect until state schools break up after for the summer. Um, the Education Secretary today said the aim is to make these changes alongside step four, um, which will see all legal limits on social distancing. And the current target for that, as you say, is 19th of July. But given the uncertainty around that, we will likely still see thousands um, of pupils staying at home during these important final weeks of term and ultimately a combined rise in pupils missing out on vital education. And just take us through the numbers of the, the, the pupils in England in state schools who are not at school at the moment. Well, the number of children off school due to COVID-19 in England is actually at its highest since schools closed in March. Data from the Department of Education showed that on Tuesday over 385,000 pupils were off school, a record number of students off school because of COVID. It also revealed that young people in more disadvantaged parts of the country are almost twice as likely as those in wealthier areas to be forced into that self-isolation, showing a real disparity between um, pupils missing out on their education. And judging by the direction of the current data, this is looking like it's only going to increase further before it gets better. 
Joshua Stokes, thank you very much. Thank you. Home buyers have been rushing to complete on properties before the stamp duty holiday comes to an end today. So what difference will it make to prices? Well, let's look at the figures for a home buyer in England or Northern Ireland looking at a property that's worth £336,000, the average asking price across Britain. If you complete today, you'll pay no stamp duty, but from tomorrow until the 30th of September, you'll have to fork out an extra £4,300. And from the 1st of October, when stamp duty reverts to its normal level, that will jump to £6,800. Joining me now is the property expert and presenter, Topsy Taiwo. Thanks for talking to us. Uh, the stamp duty holiday is really very nearly over. What's your prediction as to whether it will stop people buying houses at the current high rate that we're seeing across the country? Hi, Nina. Thanks for having me on. Um, I think there's an expectation that prices are going to drop and almost fall off a cliff edge once this stamp duty holiday ends, but I just don't see that being the case. And yes, we are sort of getting into crystal ball stuff here, but you just have to look at the insatiable demand that still exists, irrespective of the stamp duty holiday coming to an end. Lockdown has made people just want to move further out into suburban areas. You've got some of the lowest interest rates we've ever seen for a very long time. And you've also got things like the 95% mortgage guarantee scheme. And all of those things combined are really adding a lot of pressure to house prices. So I just can't see there being a huge drop in activity and prices after the stamp duty holiday ends. And that trend uh, that you mentioned of people moving out of cities and into the suburbs because of lockdown, you know, moving out of flats and wanting houses with gardens, what impact has that on, had on the cities, whether you, you take the capital, London, or, or other cities ar around the UK? Yeah, it's had, a, it's had a profound impact, actually, on some larger cities in the initial um, stages of when that first came in, both in the rental market, but also in the sales market as well. So although we've seen house price growth, it's really been concentrated in your Hertfordshire areas, areas like Bedfordshire, and also some northern cities where people traded up being close to a station or being close to restaurants and bars for wanting some outside space and just wanting some uh, extra bedroom space in order to make use of the time that they've got at home. You know, we've all been stuck at home for a very long time and have almost gone from working in the office to working at home. And that's really pushed prices up in those areas and almost softened prices in cities as well. Mm. What's your prediction for interest rates? Do we need to uh, brace people for, for rises after so many years of historic lows? It's a tough question to answer, but there's a lot of competition between lenders to drum up some business. So although we've seen such a long period of low interest rates, I can't really see that changing in the immediate future either anyway. You know, they lost quite a bit of business for a short period of time when we had the COVID-19 pandemic initially hit and things have started to get better, but they are really trying to drum up some more business as well. So I can't see there being a massive increase in interest rates. However, I wouldn't necessarily, you know, take the risk in waiting. Whilst we've got some really low rates, you, you know, I've seen rates as low as 0.99%. I would still try and lock yourself in for as long as you possibly can, just to make sure you've got that certainty of what your mortgage repayments are going to be on a monthly basis. OK, Topsy Tywo, thanks very much for all your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you very much. There's no rest for sports fans this week after Andy Murray's traumatic match on Monday and England's eventual win last night. Murray is back in action again. Later today, he'll take on the German player Oscar Otter, who says he's hoping he can end a huge icon's Wimbledon comeback, Martha Fairley. Is there a big match ahead then uh, for Andy Murray and his opponent? Uh, and Andy Murray is concerned about the state of the court. Yes, it would appear so. Andy Murray's currently preparing for his second round match against German Oscar Otter on centre court later this afternoon. That's, of course, after he put us all through the ringer on Monday in his first round match, which turned into a late night four set thriller. Um, but the condition of centre court has been the thing that's really causing problems for a lot of the big names. Novak Djokovic actually said after his opening match against British wildcard Jack Draper that he couldn't remember having fallen as 
many times as he had during his match. And then yesterday, Serena Williams was uh, in her potentially her last Wimbledon appearance, and she was forced to leave centre court in tears after she slipped. She didn't do any post-match interviews, but did put a message up on Instagram saying she was heartbroken to have to withdraw after injuring her leg. And she's clearly got Andy Murray's sympathies because he tweeted, brutal for Serena Williams, but centre court is extremely slippy out there. Wimbledon organisers are saying they've had the wettest conditions in a decade, and the, because the roof has had to be closed on centre court and number one court, that has led to additional moisture on the surface, but they're hoping that things are going to firm up soon. Martha Valley, thank you. Finally, this lunchtime, parts of North America may be sweltering with a heat wave, but it hasn't stopped these elephants enjoying their summer. Samudra, Rose 2 and Chandra have been beating the heat by splashing around in the pool at Oregon Zoo. Temperatures there have reached a record-breaking 46.6 degrees. This is a one, one way at least of uh, trying to keep your cool. That's it. Join Mary for the ITV Evening News at 6.30 from me and everyone here for now. Bye-bye.